What a week this has been. Uh, this has been uh, an unreal experience. Uh, I was excited uh, when I saw what the topic, when I was informed what the topic would be, but this has turned out uh, far better than I, than I really could have conceived. Uh, the truths that have been uh, lifted up, you know, it's you know, like when you stick that shovel in the ground where you've never dug before, and you find, you're finding things that you're surprised to find. They're in just the, uh, the pearls that have been unearthed as we've been going through these lessons have been spectacular. Uh, and I'm, I feel un un immeasurably blessed to be a, a part of it. I love the Bellevue Church of Christ. I love the truth for which you stand. I love the attitude that you show toward one another, that you show toward visitors, and that you show toward those of us who do uh, labor in the gospel. I certainly thank you so much for the kindness uh, that you have shown to me, uh, particularly recently in the, the hardships that we have faced, but uh, we, uh, myself and my family, stand in deep appreciation, appreciation for you now, uh, even more than we had previously. In the Old Testament, as we look toward the types that would ultimately see their fulfillment in the New Testament antitypes, we see that God was said to dwell in the innermost chamber of the tabernacle and later the temple, uh, that chamber which was known as the most holy place, literally as the holy of holies. Holy of holies, what does that mean? If one looks to the book immediately following Ecclesiastes, one finds that first verse of that book saying, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. That informs us a little bit about what is spoken of there. This is not just any song. It's not just another song you can go ahead and throw in the jukebox. This is something altogether surpassing other songs. And likewise, there might be multiple places that there might be spoken of as being holy. But this holy of holies is a Hebraism which describes a place possessing a holiness exceeding the holiness of any other place that might be described as holy. And so we find the King James Version rendering this word, this term, this expression, literally holy of holies into the phrase most holy place. And the new, in the New Testament, again, holy of holies is the literal expression in the Greek, but rendered as the holiest of all by the King James Version. Uh, this, these expressions accurately convey the thought found in the original. Uh, that this place is called the holy of holies. This inner chamber is referred to as the holy of holies, fully emphasizes the superlative and singular holiness that it possesses. But as we look at that holiness and we look at the expression that is used, we understand, we need to understand that holiness, true holiness, is more than a matter of words. It always is. The first holy place to the Israelites was Mount Sinai. That was where the Lord revealed himself to Israel. We find what is said in Exodus 19, 11, as instructions were given from the Lord to Moses, how he was to tell the people to prepare themselves. It said, and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds of the people round about, saying, take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but it shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. God is perfectly holy. And as such, where God dwells is holy. No man can take lightly the notion of approaching the most high God in any place that he abides. At this point, the Lord is going to make his abode on Mount Sinai. It was said, do not think about taking this lightly. Sometime prior uh, to this uh, account, the Lord revealed himself to Moses at the same mountain. 
We read of that in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 and following. It's spoken of as coming that at Mount Horeb, which is again a reference to Sinai. We read there as Moses drew near to behold that burning but not burnt bush in which God appeared. The Lord said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Verse 5. Holy ground. This is a holy place. Holiness implies something that is, quote, withheld from ordinary use, treated with special care. Another lexical source speaks of, of holiness as being that which is set apart for the service of Yahweh. And so holiness then suggests, quote, commanding respect, awesome, treated with respect, removed from profane usage. This is not something that is ordinary. It's not there for ordinary kinds of uses. And so at least from an earthly perspective, holiness is something that is atypical. And for the Israelites, atypical sights and atypical sounds would point to them that this was an atypical place. It was a holy place. All that occurred at Mount Sinai leading up to the Lord's arrival there, the restrictions against approaching the mountain, the instructions for the people to wash their clothes, the thunder and lightning, the thick cloud upon the mount, the fire and the smoke, the sound of the unusually loud trumpet that is all spoken of in Exodus chapter 19. All of this emphasizes the holiness of the occasion and the holiness of that place where God would temporarily dwell. After departing from Mount Sinai, the Israelites would never again encamp at that place which had been the dwelling place of God. Instead, they were commanded to build and bring with them a portable divine dwelling. It said in Exodus 25, 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And this dwelling was, of course, as has been spoken in the previous lectures, the tabernacle a tent, something temporary, something that could be taken with them. It and its furnishings were to be constructed according to very precise instructions given by God himself. In later centuries, uh, God would reluctantly grant to the kings of Israel their desire to build for God a more permanent abode. And they would, this would be in the form of the temple. But God still held the prerogative to determine how it was built. It was his place. He would say how it was to be built. We read about the instructions that David would pass on to Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28, 11 and following. And David would say in 1 Chronicles 28, 19, All this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. It is noteworthy that the instructions for the construction of the tabernacle and its related items that we find spoken of in Exodus 25 through 31, and then the record of the construction itself, which are found in Exodus 38 through 41, this is all interrupted by the account of the Israelite sin with the golden calf, recorded in Exodus 32. In that sin... The people of Israel desired a visible representation of deity to accompany them as they journeyed through the wilderness. They had had Moses with them, and they looked at Moses, their leader, and he was gone. He was gone for too long. We read in Exodus 32, 1, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And so they said, make us something else, something visible, something we can see, something tangible. And how ironic it is that God was providing for that visible representation during Moses' supposed delay. You know, how sad and tragic it is that people convince themselves that perverted worship fills a need that God's true worship can't supply. What the Israelites needed for their worship 
will be supplied in the tabernacle worship. And entering into the tabernacle and later the temple was a privilege from which the vast majority of Israelites were excluded. Any non-priest that dared approach it was to be put to death, much like at Mount Sinai. Similar instructions were given as recorded in Numbers 151 and 338 that they were to be put to death. Only the priests were privileged to enter into the tabernacle. But not even all priests were privileged to enter into that second chamber, the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest held that authority and that only once per year. Leviticus chapter 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. The holy place here spoken of is not that first chamber of the tabernacle that was discussed in the previous lecture that is commonly called the holy place, within the veil refers to that curtain that separated the chamber from where the other priests were allowed from that chamber where they were not permitted. Also, the mercy seat spoken of here was located in the holy of holies. In Hebrews 9 verses 6 and 7, speaking about the ordination of the first covenant, the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, we read, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. That's a reference to what we would call the holy place. The priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second tabernacle, that is the most holy place, the holy of holies, accomplishing uh, but the, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Leviticus 16 that we just quoted from a moment ago is what's being spoken of there that once a year when Aaron was permitted, Aaron and his successors who had assumed the high priesthood were permitted on that one day, that day of atonement to approach into that holy of holies. And they needed blood to enter into that holy of holies. The construction and layout of the tabernacle stressed the holiness of of the most holy place. Uh, the materials, the metals that were used were graded. Uh, you found gold, silver, and copper based on their proximity to the holy of holies. The veil between the holy place and the holy of holies stood as both a literal and a representative diviner. It represented the unrevealed mysteries of God's plan that remained during the Mosaic dispensation as one writer has observed. We think about what's said in Deuteronomy 29, 29. It was said to the Israelites, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. There were a lot of things that, were, that remained concealed during that dispensation. That doesn't mean everything has yet been revealed. But now we live in the time when the mystery has been revealed. But they were kept concealed at that time. And that veil represented that those remained concealed during that dispensation. It served as a reminder that sinful men cannot abide in the presence of a holy God. You are cut off from going here where God is, even among the priests, even the high priests, other than that one day. We read in Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. He is of pure eyes than to behold such things. Sin cannot abide with the Most High. And the veil represented the lack of access granted to God by means of the law of Moses. It was limited access that was granted during that time. And who was especially stung by this inaccessibility? Well, especially non-Jews. Those who were not part of this covenant nation that nation who was not like other nations, non-Jews were especially stung by this inaccessibility. If priests, other than the high priests, were excluded from going beyond the veil, if non-priestly Israelites were excluded from going beyond the veil, how much less uh, could those who were not 
uh, Jews and all, those were Gentiles, how much could they expect to access that which lay within the Holy of Holies? Under the law of Moses, Gentiles were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2.12 But compared to the holy place and the furnishings that were spoken of there by Brother Litke a few moments ago, the most holy place, the holy of holies, was quite sparsely furnished. But the most holy of the furnishings were found there. In Exodus 25, verses 21 and 22, we read, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment, unto the children of Israel. The testimony that will be placed here, that's spoken of, that will be placed in the ark, will be the two tablets on which the Lord would engrave the Ten Commandments. Also, the book of the law. Uh, apparently, the scrolls containing Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, that was placed either inside or next to the ark. We read in Deuteronomy 31.26, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of, the King James Version says, the ASV says, by the side of, uh, put it in the side of or by the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be therefore a witness against thee. There was a witness then against the Israelites present there in the Holy of Holies. The Israelites had violated and would repeatedly violate that law. Thus the tablets and scrolls of that law would serve as a constant reminder to the people that they stood condemned as sinners by that law. It was said the scripture hath concluded all under sin. We read in Romans chapter 3. And Romans certainly makes that clear. The Gentiles stood condemned. The Jews stood condemned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is that witness. But yet they would be reminded that the law was to be their guide. Yes, there was that condemnation there, but their guide was there as well. Also within the ark, in the midst of the Holy of Holies, would be Aaron's rod that budded. This would also serve as a reminder that God had chosen Aaron and his male descendants as priests throughout the Mosaic dispensation. There seemed to be problems with accepting God's designated leadership by the Israelites. They thought they were all holy. They had been spoken of as being a nation of priests. They thought they should all be able to do what Aaron could do. But no, there was a reminder there, and that was brought home in the rebellion and the response to it by the Lord in Numbers chapter 16. And find, what we find when Aaron's rod was caused to bud miraculously, you know, as opposed to those others. Also, the golden pot of manna placed inside the ark would remind the people that God who sustained the Israelites, would continue to sustain them. The failure to regard the Ark of the Covenant as holy, to see it as this, this furnishing that was in there, to regard it as holy, that will result in suffering and death. We look at 1 Samuel 5, when the Philistines thought they had obtained a, a great victory. And there they had the Ark. And they placed it there in Ashdod by the, by the idol of Dagon. Well... Bad things happened. And so they removed it from Ashdod. They placed it in Gath. And then they moved it to Ekron. Bad things were happening to them wherever it went. They were not putting the ark in a holy place. They regarded it as something powerful, but they were not treating it for the holy object that it was. Again, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, even among the Israelites, we find that the ark was not regarded as holy as it should have been. There are specific instructions with regard to it. David thought that transporting the ark on a, on a new cart would be great. But he would learn differently, as would Uzzah, who in his apparent naive innocence sought to steady the ark as it was wobbling on the cart. But the Lord smote him there, killed him there instantly, for his error. It was to be regarded as holy. 
covering the ark was the mercy seat. And some will regard the, the mercy seat as simply all it was was the ark cover. It really was a furnishing. It's spoken of as being a furnishing unto itself, its own item. But on either end of the mercy seat was a carved cherub between which the Lord dwelt. Time and again we find the Lord being referred to as the one that dwelleth between the cherubim. Only the sprinkling of blood upon that mercy seat could procure God's mercy. As spoken of in Leviticus 16 verses 14 through 16, that high priest would approach into that holy place, that most holy place, but he needed that blood if mercy was to be found. But yet even as we look at what was there in this most holy place, this holy of holies, but yet mercy was found closest to God. He wasn't just spoken of as dwelling where the tables of the covenant were. He was spoken of as dwelling between the cherubim on that mercy seat. No earthly light shone in the Holy of Holies. The candlestick remained behind in that first chamber of the tabernacle. For the most holy place, the glory of God was sufficient. Now there was the incense that would come from that from the holy place and is spoken of actually in Hebrews chapter 9 as pertaining to the most holy place. Now the altar of incense remained in the holy place, but yet that which came from it was necessary to cover that mercy seat, that mercy might be found. And so that's the most holy place, that's the holy of holies spoken of in the Old Testament. But let's consider the true holy of holies. There was nothing intrinsically holy about the ground on which the holy of holies stood. It would move from place to place. It would move in different locations. And there was nothing intrinsically holy about that ground, nor was there anything intrinsically holy even in the curtains or walls surrounding it. It was only made holy by the presence of God. God made the Holy of Holies holies. He was there that made it holy. But, but think about this. God could only dwell in an earthly place, and that's what the Holy of Holies was. Holy of Holies was. He could only dwell there in a representative sense. Even as he celebrated the completion of the temple's construction, Solomon asked, even regarding this glorious temple that had been made, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded? 1 Kings 8, 27. The Mosaic tabernacle, even the Holy of Holies, was never the true tabernacle of God. In Hebrews 9, 24, it said, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the truth but into heaven itself. They are the figures of the truth. The holy of holies constructed and revered by the Israelites was only a copy or representation of the true holy of holies, which is what? Heaven itself. That is the true into heaven itself. This abode of sinlessness and crystalline perfection has remained the true dwelling of God. But that said, the Israelites' holy of holies instructs men concerning the nature of the true holy of holies. As the Old Testament holy of holies was unseen and hidden to all but the high priest, so is the holy of holies to all but the high priest who has entered. Jesus Christ himself, he who dwells there. The, the Father who is in the Holy of Holies remains one to be feared. We read in Hebrews 10, even as it speaks about what has happened as Christ has entered into the Holy of Holies, it's said there in Hebrews 10, 30 and 31, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is one to be feared. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. There may be no literal ark there. 
nor the scrolls or tablets of the law inside of that ark. But God remains a God of law. He holds men accountable by an absolute standard and will finally and eternally condemn those who fail to conform their lives and their souls to that standard. Revelation chapter 20 speaks about that final day of the universe when the dead, small and great, are going to stand before that great white throne of the Almighty and they're going to be judged by their works according to those things that are written. They will be judged by an absolute standard. And anyone whose name is not written in the book of life will be cast in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But yet as God dwelt in the Mosaic Holy of Holies in closest proximity to mercy, so he is rich in mercy, Ephesians 2.4. He offers those riches of mercy to all those who will receive them as it goes on and discusses. In verses 4 through 7, we think about the light. There was no actual object of light placed, no artificial light placed into the Holy of Holies. And likewise, in that eternal Holy of Holies, there's that city. It had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Revelation 21 and verse 23. God's dwelling place holds indescribable beauty. The mosaic holy of holies was constructed of the finest materials available, yet they cannot compare with the materials found in the true holy of holies. You look at the discussion of it in Revelation 21, 10 and following, and it speaks of being constructed with the most precious of metals, the most precious of stones. As D.R. Dungan emphasizes in his discussion of types and has been mentioned multiple times this lectureship, the antitype, heaven, is always superior to the type, the mosaic holy of holies. That's where God dwells. That is the holy of holies. And how sad it is that many fail to see that God no longer dwells in earthly structures. You have Muslims who are facing Mecca to pray as though God still dwelt in some kind of earthly location like that as his special abode. Mormons will view Salt Lake City and other places that they've been kicked out of as some kind of special places. Uh, modern day Jews view the western wall of the Wailing Wall as holy. And even professed Christians will speak about the Holy Land and speak about various holy sites. But folks, if we're speaking about those places, holy, we're missing it. To find the most holy place today, one's going to have to lift his eyes upward. That's the true holy of holies. Let's then consider approaching the holy of holies. The one who is behind the veil is to be feared. But despite that, a Christian can come to that throne in confidence. You think about how Esther had to say when she went before her own husband's throne, if I perish, I perish. She didn't know. She wasn't sure. Perhaps I've come to the kingdom for such a time as this, as, as was instruct, told him by Mordecai. But she didn't know. But we can come boldly. We can come boldly to that throne, we're told in Hebrews 4 and verse 15. This is because the Christian's high priest has entered into the Holy of Holies and made the necessary atonement. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and following. Speaking of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, it said, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That one sacrifice for sins was himself. That blood of bulls and goats that was offered continually year after year, it could not possibly cleanse the conscience. It could not possibly ultimately take away sins. He just had to offer one sacrifice for sins forever. And he sat down on the right hand of God. That place of prominence, that place of rule. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, them that are made holy. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us 
through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Matthew 27, 50 tells us that Jesus, when he cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He died there upon Calvary's cross, making that necessary sacrifice for sins, that one sacrifice. But after you've done that, we read in the following verse, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Access previously forbidden to that holy of holies now openly granted. Not only to Aaronic priests, nor even just to Israelites, but to people from all nations who would have their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and their bodies washed with pure water. That is, those who would have the blood of Christ applied inwardly via baptism outwardly. A heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Know ye not that some of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Where his blood was shed, we have our hearts sprinkled with that precious blood. But when our bodies are washed with that pure water, we're baptized into that death. The like figure where to even baptism doth now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer or the interrogation, the appeal for a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have that hope and we have that confidence. The rending of the veil signified all sorts of things. It signified the abrogation of the law of Moses, which had clearly prohibited access to the Holy of Holies by all but that Levitical high priest. Remember, again, for him even, it was only once a year. What could make such access possible? Only the death of Christ. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, enmity, strife, the state of being enemies, the absence of friendship. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself in tw of twain one new man. He did that. He took away that old law he abrogated at the cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which is against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out away, he nailed it to his cross, Colossians 2 and verse 14. The Hebrews writer speaks of the veil through which Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies as his flesh. Jesus had assumed flesh when he left heaven above, when he, be took, when he was incarnated as man. But that flesh was then destroyed. And that destruction of that flesh made possible access to the holy of holies. By a new and living way, he's consecrated for us through his flesh. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Wait, what? Far off. You couldn't draw near. You couldn't come to the tabernacle. You couldn't go into that holy place. Much less could you go into that veil in the Holy of Holies. Now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh. You're brought close. How? By the blood of Christ. Paul spoke of Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Romans 3.25 this word for propitiation only occurs one other time in the New Testament. It's the Greek hilasterion, and it is translated mercy seat in this other occurrence. And we find it being said, and over the ark were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Hebrews 9 and verse 5. That mercy seat, Jesus Christ has become our mercy seat. With boldness, we are then told that we can come in Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Uh, in verse 22, in full assurance of faith. That means having no doubt whatsoever. These are just a couple of the expressions used to emphasize the confidence 
with which a Christian can approach the holy of holies. This applies to public worship, private prayer, family devotions, any other scriptural way in which a Christian might draw near. We mentioned earlier about how this, the altar of incense was spoken of as pertaining to the holy of holies. We find it being spoken of. Again, the Hebrews writer understood the layout of the tabernacle. He wasn't confused. He knew where it was. But we likewise have access through prayer. What a wonderful thing it is to have such access. But we cannot take it haphazardly. Expanded access has been granted, but don't let us think for a moment. Don't be deluded into thinking that our holy of holies, the one in which God truly dwells, is any less holy than the Mosaic holy of holies. It is all the more so. The Levitical priests and all that pertains to the tabernacle serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that I make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. We don't have the same pattern. We most certainly do have a pattern. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3 and verse 17. How thankful ought the Christian to be for right to approach the Holy of Holies and for that one who has made that possible. For Christ is not entering the holy places made with hands. He's not just strolling that tent. He's not just strolling the temple. He's, not, he's now appeared into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is our high priest there for us. He is an advocate there for us. And we can approach that holy of holies with confidence. But not only can we approach it, Christ's entrance into the true holy of holies gives us the hope of entering that place ourselves. The Hebrews writer speaks of the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunners for us entered, even Jesus, Hebrews 6, 18 through 20. Whither Jesus entered is heaven, and he entered for us. His resurrection provides assurance of our resurrection. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, uh, assuring that there's more to come, that we also arise from our, quote, sleep. And Christ's ascension to heaven likewise provides a firm assurance of hope that we can enter into that holy of holies. We are tremendously blessed. Life is a blessing. God created all things, the world, the universe to be inhabited by man. We are blessed to live in a world created by God. But that said, this world is not holy. Sin has stained this world and has disturbed every aspect of life here on earth. Sorrow, pain, sickness, death. These are all everyday realities of earthly existence, ultimately because of sin. And nothing that we see on this earth, if it's confined to the earth, nothing that's confined to this earth is certain. So what hope can any man or woman find on earth? For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Hebrews 13, 14. We seek a city to come. The Apostle John saw and described that wonderful place to come. He was describing the Holy of Holies. But no longer is it what is described in the book of Exodus 25 and following. No longer is it a place of 10 cubits cubed. But is a city adorned with splendor and crowned with perfection as described in Revelation 21 through 22. Again, all the precious metals, precious stones with which, is, with which it is constructed. The glorious company that dwells there. God being there. The tree of life that man has denied himself access to because of sin. It's there. And the water of life that whosoever will can lay hold on. That's there. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. 
And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Folks, there are no more will anyone have to endure sin. No one will have to endure sin's consequences. But for one to maintain his hope of entering the Holy of Holies, he needs to take heed, lest he draw back into perdition. Hebrews 10, 39. We cannot allow ourselves to become of that number. Now is the time to draw near. The Holy of Holies found in the Israelite tabernacle in the temple provides an appropriate picture of heaven, God's dwelling place. The severe restrictions placed on entering that holy place, that most holy place, the Holy of Holies, should generate tremendous appreciation for access granted Christians to approach that holy place, to approach heaven, and ultimately entering into it when this world is no more. However, it is crucial that one is found holy in Christ Jesus as mentioned in the previous lecture, that one is presently in the holy place if one expects to enter into the holy of holies. And true holiness is more than just a matter of words. It always has been. We have a hope given to us in Christ. We read in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 and following, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Jesus Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. Friend, if you're here as a child of God who has blemished your soul who has blemished that bride of Christ who has blemished that holy place and ultimately blemished the name of Christ himself Friend, you need to make things right. If you've done such in a public way, the invitation is to you to make things right. Confess as public as it's known. If private, confess it privately. We want you to be right with the Lord. We want to see you in that most holy place. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, do know what we just quoted. Jesus Christ gave himself for the church, but how is it going to be sanctified? How is it going to be cleansed? with the washing of water by the word. One is going to be, have to be baptized according to the teachings of Scripture. One is going to have to be born of water and of the Spirit, John 3 and verse 5. One is going to have to heed the Spirit's teachings found in the New Testament. Learn what it says. Learn about the Christ that has brought salvation and believe that gospel. Repent of your sins. Confess that sweet name. And be immersed for the remission of your sins knowing that they are then washed away. You are in that holy place, granted access to the Holy of Holies, and with the right to enter, ultimately when this life is over, when Christ has come to claim His own, into the Holy of Holies. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. James 4.8 If we can assist you, come. Together we stand, and as we sing, the song of invitation.